Hello there, my fellow seekers of the truth, and welcome to the fourth episode in my coverage of the Primarch Lorgar. Word to the wise, it seems this might end up being my longest Primarch miniseries yet. That's because we are at number four already, and there's still some ways to go, so I estimate maybe six videos in total. Last time, I ended Lorgar's story in a little bit of a cliffhanger. So today we are going to dive right back in and continue telling you about his adventures in the Eye of Terror. I am your host, the Grim Dark Narrator, and without further ado, let the Bible thumping continue, shall we? The Urizen, aka Lorgar, found himself suddenly transported before the Eternity Gate, located within the Emperor's Imperial Palace on Terra. This was the ultimate barrier that was the portal to the Emperor's inner sanctum, where he kept his genetic laboratories sealed away from his sons and servants. Ingefell refused to explain how they had been transported through space and time to appear there, because some realities could not be contained by the mortal mind. She instructed Lorgar to look upon his surroundings with an immortal sight. Shocked by the sudden revelation, Lorgar was granted a vision of the Battle of Terra. The Primarch was surrounded by thousands of phantasmal Astartes fighting and dying at his fate. Foremost in the thick of the fighting were the yellow armored Astartes of Rogal Dorn's Imperial Fists Legion. They fought fiercely against an entire legion unknown to Lorgar, clad in cardinal red. The Primarch finally recognized the crimson-clad Astartes for who they were, his own word bearers, their slate grey battle plate replaced by power armor the color of fresh blood. Ingefell informed the Primarch that he was right. The Legion's old colors had been cast away to herald the changes taking hold of humanity. They were no longer the bearers of the Emperor's word because they were the bearers of Lorgar's. He continued to look on, witnessing a larger-than-normal Astartes transform into the middle of battle into a gargantuan demon-possessed Astartes. The vision showed the demonically-possessed Space Marine going on a bloody rampage through the ranks of the Imperial Fists, before dying at the hands of the Primarch Sanguinius. In this belief, Ingefell informed Lorgar that this champion was none other than his blessed son, Argel Tal and that this was how he would die. Of course, this was not set in stone, and as you well know, demons lie. As the Primarch attempted to step forward, he suddenly found himself in another place. He had seen all that needed to be seen. Enraged, Lorgar tired of being led around by the nose into the demon's prepared lessons. Ingefell warned the Primarch to watch his tone when addressing one of the Chaos Gods chosen to which Lorgar replied that he was only there by his own choice, and that he would live there by the same avenue. Calming himself though, Lorgar knew that he was there to learn the truth of the gods, and that Ingefell was there to show it to him. He wanted to know why he had been summoned there, and why he had been shaped since birth to be brought to this place. Ingefell replied that Lorgar had been summoned because his life had been engineered to ensure this moment would take place. He was here, now, because the gods wanted it. In the tangled skies of time's web, Ingefell had seen many possible futures where Lorgar had not come to them. Lorgar wanted to know why he was brought here. Why not his brother Horus, or Gilliman? They were the generals that he could never be. Why not Sanguinius? Why not Magnus or Dorn? Especially Magnus, for he was the most powerful of all the Primarchs. Ingefell replied that the Crimson King was already a servant of Chaos, except he didn't know it yet. He came to the ruinous powers without needing to be summoned, and without ever considering the notion of faith. He came for power, because that was why all things of flesh came to the powers of Chaos. With this revelation, Ingefell revealed one vision, more than 40 Terran years in the future. 
With one gesture, Lorgar found himself staring at an uneven skyline that he knew instantly, for he studied there for almost a decade. He was in the silver city of Tiska, the capital of the Thousand Suns homeworld of Prospero. Upon further inspection, Lorgar saw the other devastation. Cracked spires, broken pyramids, shattered glass, and fallen city walls turned into rubble. Lorgar inquired as to the cause of this madness that he now beheld. Ingefell said that Tiska would burn in the crucible of the coming war, for it must come to pass. Lorgar swore that he would never allow it, but Ingefell warned that it must, for this was to be the final incident in Magnus's illumination. Betrayed by the Emperor, by his own brothers, he would bring this city to the warp in order to escape final destruction. Within the Eye of Terror, he would forge a bastion for the war to come. A war that Lorgar would begin, but never laid. The war to bring all the truth of chaos to the Imperium. Lorgar had come to find the gods, and he had found them, as they had always intended. Their eyes were now turned towards mankind. The Chaos Gods had said to the word-bearer Argel Tal, as they now said to Lorgar, that humanity must embrace the truth of divine reality, or suffer the same fate as the Eldar. With resolute clarity, Lorgar discovered that the Chaos Gods sought a symbiosis with life, a conjoining of the insult and the neverborn in natural harmony. The Gods needed humanity, for they could not claim the material realm without them. Their power was strangled when there were none to offer prayers or deeds in worship. This was why the spread of the Emperor's atheistic imperial truth presented such a danger to them. Lorgar, however, felt that the Chaos Gods had chosen poorly. He was pleased and proud to have discerned the primordial truth, to be chosen by beings powerful enough to be considered divine by the truest meaning of the word. But he would struggle to bring their light to humanity. He could not win a war against the living god sitting upon the Terran throne. Ingefell told Lorgar that he would strive, and eventually he would succeed. Lorgar retorted that he possessed only a hundred thousand warriors, far too few to make planet fall upon Terra and overthrow the Emperor. Ingefell told Lorgar that in the future he would attract many more followers, as he liberated world after world. It was written that after he sailed away from the Eye of Terror, the Legion would walk on a different path. He would crush resistance beneath his armored boots and draw fresh, faithful humans into his service. Some would be slaves in the bowels of the Wordbearer's ships. Others would be Lorgar's flock, to shepherd them towards enlightenment. Many more would be taken into the ranks of the Wordbearers themselves, and bred into new Astartes. Uneasy with these revealed truths, Lorgar asked again why he had been chosen as the god's instrument. Ingefell replied that it had to be him. Each of the other legions would die for their Primarch, and lay down their lives for the Imperium. But the Imperium was the cancer killing the human race. Even when some of Lorgar's brothers turned against the Emperor, they would fight to command the Imperium. It was only the word-bearers who would die for the truth, and for humanity itself. If humanity became an empire instead of a species, it would fall to alien claws and the wrath of the Chaos Gods. It was the way of things, and this had happened before to the Eldar, and would happen again. The next scene took place 40 years in the future. Magnus had fallen victim to his own arrogance, and now resided in the tallest tower of his broken city on a world prepared for him within the Eye of Terror. Lorgar informed Ingefell that he would speak to the Crimson King, but the demon warned the Primarch that he would not be allowed to stand before Magnus. Heedless of the guide's warning, Lorgar made his way towards Magnus's tower. As he ascended to the top of the tower and finally looked upon his brother, Lorgar reconciled logic with emotion. For though he looked upon the face of Magnus, the face of Magnus was much older. In 40 years, the Crimson King looked like he had aged 400. 
Magnus was not surprised by his brother's presence, for the world in which he now resided held endless surprises. He wondered what incarnated hallucination he was addressing this time. Magnus thought his fellow Primarch was a poor simulacra of the real Lorgar, for his eyes didn't burn with the fire of faith anymore, nor did he bear the same scars. Lorgar tried to explain to Magnus that he was not an apparition, for he was his real brother on the final night of his pilgrimage. Growing bored of the encounter, Magnus banished Lorgar from his new realm with a single thought. The word-bearer Primarch once again found himself on Shanriatha. When he picked himself up from the sand, he saw that his demonic guide Ingafel appeared to be dying. The demon had used its already diminishing might to rescue Lorgar from the sorcery of Magnus. Lorgar wanted to know why his brother would not speak to him, and Ingafel informed him that Magnus was just a tool of Tsinch now, the changer of the ways. Lorgar inquired as to which kind of leader was he, since Magnus ended up just as a pawn. Ingefell told the Primarch that he was the chosen of the Pantheon, for he alone had come to chaos out of idealism for the betterment of the species. Convinced by the demon's prescient vision, Lorgar demanded to know his own fate in the true war for mankind's future yet to come. Ingefell told Lorgar that once the betrayed broke across the galaxy, there were countless moments in which he might meet his end. Some were likelier than others. The demon warned Lorgar that no being may know its future written out before it. Yet, on a world named Shrike, if Lorgar interceded in an argument before Magnus and Lehman Russ, there was a very distinct possibility that he would be slain in their duel. If he ever drew a weapon against his brother Korax, in a battle he could never win, then he would almost certainly die. Pushing aside information about choices he would not have to make for decades, Lorgar asked why they had returned to this dead planet. The dying Ingafell explained that she did not intend for it to be so, for the demon had used the last of its power, dragging Lorgar away from Magnus's chamber. It was not her intention to show this world again, and something else had returned them there. It appeared one of the Chaos Gods desired to test Lorgar's worthiness to serve as the mortal champion of Chaos. Ingefell chided Lorgar for believing that the Chosen of the Pantheon might be allowed to leave the Realm of the Gods without first passing their test. Yet all the Chaos Gods were ultimately fickle beings, and one of the gods broke the agreement that all four had made, wishing to test Lorgar against one of his mightiest servants instead. With a bestial roar, Angarath the Unbound materialized. The blood god Korn had violated the temporary accord of the Chaos Gods and sent forth his mightiest bloodthirster, the guardian of the Skull Throne, to test Lorgar's mettle. With no choice, Lorgar was forced to defend himself and duel the mighty creature, and he eventually proved himself to be the victor, though he was badly wounded in the process. Collapsing in the aftermath of his unexpected victory, he heard a single voice, and then another, similar to the first, but somehow flawed. Lorgar looked up at a sudden appearance of another winged creature a grotesque, avian figure with feathered wings and two vulture heads. The creature informed Lorgar that it was the official representative of all the Chaos Gods. It identified itself as Kairos Fateweaver, the Oracle of Change. The Lord of Change had come to bring the chance for a final choice. Lorgar could have personal glory or divine destiny. This moment of truth would come many decades in the future, during the infamous Battle of Kalf. It would be there that Lorgar had to make the most momentous decision of his life. To fight his brother, Robut Gilliman, where he would succeed in killing him, and by doing so achieve a sense of satisfaction and the respect of his brother Primarchs. Yet by doing so, he would also lose the coming war. However, if he chose to turn his back on personal glory and let Gilliman live, 
he would taste bitter defeat in his personal quest for the destruction of Gilliman in the 13th Legion that so insulted the word bearers at Monarchia. But the chance for him to succeed in the illumination of humanity would be far greater. The Primarch had to choose whether he would stand among his brothers as an equal, with vengeance as his goal, or work in the name of the Chaos Gods, tasting shame in return for a far greater victory. While the Fate Weaver's two heads normally made two predictions, one being the absolute truth and the other being a lie, in this instance the Greater Demon explained that both of the heads had told the truth. Or had they? Leaving the bemused Primarch with this perplexing conundrum, Fate Weaver then vanished. Left alone once again with the dying Ingafell, fucking die already, Lorgar demanded to know how much of what he had seen was true. The demon replied, all of it, or none, or perhaps something in between. The demon had shown him what the Chaos Gods demanded he bear witness to, but now he wanted Ingefell to show him what he wanted to see. Ingefell agreed, for it was permitted. Lorgar had seen what he must do to ensure victory, he had seen the fate of the galaxy if the Emperor's lies were not challenged. Now, the Primarch wanted to walk other worlds within the Eye of Terror. If this was the gateway to the heaven and hell of humanity's myth, he wanted to be shown more of it. Lorgar wanted to see the possibilities in these immutable worlds, to be shown what the warp could offer humanity if they conceded to the merging of flesh and spirit. Ingefell said that she could do all of this, but Lorgar had one final wish before he returned to the Imperium, for there was one last thing he must see over any other. The answer to the question of what happened if the forces of chaos would lose the coming war. This mysterious truth changed Lorgar and the word bearers forever, as they were exposed to the ruinous powers of chaos and slowly corrupted. They were the very first of the Legiones Astartes to worship the chaos gods and become traitors to the Emperor in their hearts. Lorgar and the word bearers spent the remaining years of the Great Crusade attempting to enlighten humanity about the real spiritual nature of creation ultimately resorting to manipulation and deception to sway eight of the Primarchs to the cause of chaos, as their gods demanded, the most notable being Warmaster Horus himself. When it became clear that mankind could not be enlightened without first denouncing the false imperial truth, Lorgar willingly helped orchestrate the terrible battle of Istvan III and the Dropsite Massacre at Istvan V as well as the larger Horus heresy itself. And that is why we have hashtag blame it on Lorgar. When Horus openly declared his rebellion against the Emperor, the word bearers were one of the first legions to support him and his cause. The worlds they had conquered since their conversion to chaos also joined the side of the traitors having been secretly corrupted to the worship of the dark gods in the final days of the Great Crusade. And that, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about Lorgar's search and discovery of the primordial truth. What are your thoughts on Lorgar's actions and visions at the behest of the Chaos Gods? I realize there's a lot of debating to be had here, so feel free to indulge yourselves in the comments below. Was this video informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for future videos. Thank you kindly for watching, and I wish you all a peaceful day. The Emperor protects.